to this day, to this day, rich people don't sleep eight hours a day. That's stupid. Use your common sense. What up, Bushido Spirit Euphoria Season 1, Episode 4, Shook Ones Part 2, Breakdown. But before I get into that, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Also hit the notification icon that lets you know when I drop videos. Let's get right into the sauce. So the title Shook Ones 2 is a Mob Deep song. It could be referring to the fear Cal felt when Jules almost exposed him in front of his family. The fear Jules felt meeting up with Nate. Maddie's fear of Nate after he choked the shit out of her. Cat's fear of being unwanted. A lot of people were shook this episode. They feared losing it all. Let's start off with Jules. She had the biggest part in this episode. At age 11, she was admitted into a psychiatric hospital. Unbeknownst to her, Jules had gender dysphoria. There was a conflict between her physical assigned gender and the gender with which she identified. It was hell, constant discomfort something she never really got over, being a girl trapped in a boy's body. So to cope, she'd hurt herself with knives, forks, sometimes even cans. The hospital had to supply her with mitts. Eventually, Jules got better and came home, but her mom got worse and went away. However, her dad, who she loved, quit his job to be closer to home. She didn't need her mother. Fuck that bitch. Transition me looks flyer anyway, said Jules at age 13. At age 16, those puberty blockers started to bear fruit. All the masculine features she hated about herself slowly dissipated. Guys began to notice her, but they weren't the best suitors. They were quote unquote straight guys with families at home, but Jules didn't mind. Those experiences made her feel kinda, sorta, like a real woman, not some boy in a dress. Those relationships weren't organic. Not like what she had with Rue. That was real. It's the night of the carnival, and everyone is here, including Rue. Jules spots her in the crowd and waves. The two converge, reunited with a hug instead of a kiss this time. Both Rue and Jules agreed to never speak of the incident again. The two formed a party of their own, leaving their previous parties behind. And the festivities continued, until Jules spotted someone else she recognized. Hey, it's the guy from the hotel I fucked. Really? That's Nate's dad, Rue says. Jules is sure that's the same guy, but Rue wasn't convinced. So to prove it, Jules heads towards the chili stand to see Nate's father, Kyle. Him and his family are currently participating in the annual chili contest at the carnival. Jules orders a cup of chili. Kyle turns to her and is visibly shaken. He tries to play it off, but fumbles the cup of chili. When handing it over to Jules, their hands touch. Nate is there to witness the debacle. He is aware of Jules and his father's relationship. He watched that tape eight times. It was his favorite, but he remained silent, calm. But the same couldn't be said for his father. If I had to pick an image to describe it, Mr. Krabs meme, he was visibly disoriented. Didn't know his left from his right, but somehow he managed to spot Rue, looking at him from a distance. Rue exits, and so does Jules. But their troubles aren't over yet. Gia is missing. Her mother attempted to call her several times, but she didn't pick up. So Rue and Jules split up to cover more ground and search for Gia. The chili contest ends. So Kyle searches for Jules. He didn't know what her intentions were. Was she trying to blow up his spot? Expose him to the world? His wife? He ends up spotting her outside the carnival grounds. Still petrified, he begs, her not to reveal his secret. Jules says I won't. Rue won't either. I promise. I have no intentions of hurting you. I'm sorry about earlier. Cal says, thank you. Damn, he's way more understanding. Why is Nate a serial killer? Speaking of Nate, Jules has her big meetup with Tyler. She sits on a stone picnic table and waits for his arrival. Nate pulls up. Ominous music plays. Jules stands in disbelief. She realized in that instant, she'd been tricked. Shy Guy 118 or Tyler was actually Nate, but it's too late. No, 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 she whimpers. Nate's like, relax, I'm a different man now. Nate grabs her arm. Ominous music gets louder. Jules tells him to let her go. He does. The two wander near a lake. Nate appears to be confessing. I fall asleep to you. I wake up to you. I kind of feel closer to you than anyone in the world. Jules begins to cry. I don't trust you, Nate. Nate swallows. Ominous music ramps up. Wind starts to blow. I don't trust you either. 
Did anyone else feel like it was over for Jules in this moment? This felt like Jason's origin story. Nate was about to throw her ass in Crystal Lake. But fortunately, that did not happen. Nate caresses her face, then kisses her. After that, he shoves his thumb down her throat, like his daddy. And just when you thought he was gonna come out the closet, Nate's sensitive side dissipates. I'm solid Nate now. He reveals his plan in supervillain fashion. The reason for the catfish. He is blackmailing Jules. If she doesn't leave his family alone, he'll send all her news to the authorities with her IP address and account linked. She'll be seen as a distributor of child pornography. And according to Nate, children may face the same penalty as adults. Jules looks Nate in the eye. You know what I think? I think you're a faggot, just like your father. Nate grabs Jules, but he maintains his composure and lets her go. That act alone allowed me to see he cares way more about Jules than Maddie. This nigga almost snapped Maddie's neck. He didn't leave a bruise on Jules. Anyway, Jules decides to not go home and ends up sneaking into Rue's room. Rue asks her how the date went. Jules says he didn't look like his picture. The episode ends with the two cuddling in bed and Jules kisses Rue. Damn. Let's talk about Rue. Last episode ended with Rue calling Ali. She took him up on his offer to eat pancakes and talk. This episode opens up with the two of them at Denny's or some random fucking diner. Rue starts talking nonsensical, apathetic bullshit, but Ali sees right through that. He's a real nigga. He says, I don't give a shit. Why did you really call me? Rue explains what happened between her and Jules, how she misread the whole situation. She wanted to smash the homie, but Jules is straight. She likes dicks and daisies, but Rue is still infatuated, calls their friendship the best thing that has ever happened to her in a while. Girl, you the best. You the fucking best. You the fucking best. The best I ever had. Best I ever had. But is this what Rue needs? Ali compares her obsession to Jules to that of drugs, implying she could possibly get over both. And maybe it's for the better. But this is a good thing, Rue says. Didn't drugs feel good the first time you tried them? Ali responds. Message. Then the episode flashes forward to the carnival. Everyone is there. And... Rue is stuck chaperoning Gia, her sister. Lexi is here as well, Jules replacement, but not for long. Jules spots Rue in the crowd and the two hug it out, putting the past behind them. But you could clearly tell Rue wasn't over it and Jules seemed unaffected or she was putting up a good front. Anyway, Gia and Lexi's services were no longer needed. They didn't have what Jules had. The two slowly fade into the crowd. <laughs> Fast forward past Jules meeting Nate's dad at the chili stand, Gia is missing. She hasn't answered her phone all night. Her mother is worried. So Rue and Jules split up to cover more ground. After several hours looking, Rue ends up finding Gia outside the fairgrounds, hanging out with a group of suspicious people. And hey, look, this group has Troy and Roy, the two degenerates that watched Kate get pounded, then sold the tape. This can't be good. Her sister is with these niggas? These niggas? Sharing weed. Rue sees her sister is high and gets upset. We're leaving, she says. Gia refuses at first, but eventually calms. One of the twins goes full Papega, calls Rue a bitch, says she ain't been the same since the overdose. No shit, nigga. Fuck. It's difficult. Telling someone to stay off drugs when you do the shit. She crack is whack. The two share a moment together on their way home contemplating what to tell their mother. Later that night, Jules sneaks in through the window and reciprocates some of the love Rue was giving out. Being dumped by Nate confused her. Am I straight or gay? I'll let Rue decide. First see him and Maddie argue. They can't seem to find each other in the crowd of people at the carnival. The two eventually meet up, but Nate's not happy. Maddie's outfit is too revealing. She looks like a whore. Normal circumstances, this attire would be okay, but she has to dress up and play nice for his family. They're present at the carnival for the annual chili contest. They won five years in a row. This is serious. I mean, his parents already dislike her. So Nate tells Maddie to go home and change expeditiously. She refuses and ends up exploring the carnival alone. That is until she meets up with Cassie. Both girls are having serious relationship issues. It's at this time, Maddie tells Cassie, Nate has a bunch of dicks on his phone and I don't know what that means. Is he a dick connoisseur? Last night, he was listening to Old Town Road. Wow, he fucked me from the back. The two take Molly to sort out their problems and then agree to fuck shit up. Bad bitches doing bad shit. 
Fast forward, Maddie shows up at the chili stand to congratulate the Jacobs family on another victory, but it's clearly not genuine. She proceeds to call Nate's mother a cunt and knocks over the chili pot, spilling the leftovers on the ground. She's tired of playing nice and being treated like a plaything. Nate in a rage grabs Maddie by the arm and takes her to the empty side of the carnival. Oh shit, they about to have makeup sex. Psych, he grabs her by the throat and rams her head into the side of a trailer. His grip tightened around her neck. You're fucking dead to me, he says. And for a moment, she believed it. Nate comes to his senses, ugh, oh, ugh. Oh. Maddie is left gasping for air, but she's not done yet. As Nate walks away, she yells, I saw the dicks. He immediately turns around and apologizes. Those dicks aren't mine, they're Chris's. He told me to hold them for him. Obviously, I'm joking. It's not what you think, Nate says. I'm going through a lot of shit. Maddie doesn't fully understand, but she agrees to not tell anyone else. Anyway, Maddie goes home to cry in the mirror. Psychopath Nate nearly killed her. His grip left bruises on her neck. She'll be wearing turtlenecks for weeks. Nate's father also hurries home and runs to his porn collection, only to discover one of his films are missing. It was his favorite one. Dun dun dun. Obviously, Nate has it, but we don't know if that's a part of the child porn package. I mean, his father is in that video. It may be for his own personal collection. Since he refuses to give in to his desires, he'll just watch his father fuck Jules repeatedly. Yay! Let's discuss Chris and Cassie and their fucked up relationship. So, when Chris gets around Nate, he turns into Johnny Unite. His dick shrivels up. Which is odd, because he's older. Anyway, Chris is in college, so he doesn't see his best friend as often as he'd like. So why not stop by the chili stand? The only issue with that is he brought Cassie with him. Nate hates Cassie, not because of anything she said or did to him. He just believes she's slutty, not pure and virtuous like Maddie. So as soon as he spots her, he gets offended immediately. Are you still together? He asks, referring to Chris and Cassie. Chris responds with, we chillin'. <laughs> Cassie does not like that response, but she remains silent. Then Papa Nate cuckolds Chris even more with the other thing he's uncomfortable talking about, his lack of playing time. But Chris is warmed up to the idea. He says, I gotta wait my turn. But that response wasn't good enough for Nate's father. You'll never get playing time with that attitude. Fuck. Lord God help that boy. They're gonna whip him dead. What's your name? Say it! Toby! But it doesn't end there. Kyle continues, just trying to help you keep a girl like her, pointing at Cassie. Nate laughs. Cassie is mortified. Why, she says. It's not like we're in a relationship. She storms out. Chris follows. Look, Cassie, I do love you. But Nate, Nate will talk shit about your past. Cassie says, what do you mean? Chris responds, nigga, you know, you out here more than jewels. Cassie doesn't say anything, but a single tear drips down her eye. Chris says, it's fine, it's fine. I think I'm done with tonight. So he goes home. Cassie cries until she meets up with Maddie. Again, the two take Molly and make questionable decisions. Bad bitches don't think, they just do. Chris's inability to man up to his best friend leads Cassie into the arms of another guy. Nothing serious happens. She hangs out with him briefly. Long story short, she ends up fucking the carousel ride. It's a slip and slide now. A lot of people were watching. Nothing will make you sober up like embarrassment. Cassie just can't seem to escape her past. She continues to cry within the night. And finally, Thickums McGee, aka Cat, enjoying life at the carnival, being a thought. And out of nowhere, Ethan rolls up. The two have fun at the carnival together. Ethan appears to be winning her over, but it doesn't last like all things in this show. Ethan sends Kat to get some slushies. While she's gone, a friend of Ethan's sister, who is very attractive, starts talking to him about a shift change. Kat sees this and completely misreads the situation. She gets cold feet, literally. She dropped two big ass slushies on them, SMH. Kat feeling unattractive, Runs off to fuck some other dude. Ethan gets cuckold again. She just needs that instant gratification. She'd rather Ethan tear all her clothes off and fuck her on the carousel than be a genuinely nice guy. But lucky for her, Ethan doesn't see her smash that other guy. So there is still hope for this relationship. But if Kat keeps going, she's gonna turn into a Cassie. And you don't want that reputation. Even when you're good, you're bad. Yes, finally I'm finished. That is pretty much my review. I'm sure I got a couple things wrong. Let me know in the comment section. I know you will. 
but this was an enjoyable episode. It felt like a Tarantino film, like the finale, when all the characters converge on one point, and we see all these interactions, all these discussions, conversations. All hell usually breaks loose, and that's the best part. Again, the cinematography is top notch. I'm really enjoying this show. That is it for me. Peace out. I am Bushido Spirit. Catch me on the next review.